2 Thessalonians chapter 3, we see Paul begins to close out this letter. Chapter 3, and today we're going to focus on two verses, just two verses. I, I had in my mind going into preparing for this message this past week that I was covering five verses. I told you last week I didn't know how long it would take us to preach through this chapter and uh, just reading, studying, and meditating and getting some advice from some folks who I trust dearly. I, we're, we believe we've really heard from God and we're going to cover just two verses today. And while you're turning there in chapter 3 of 2 Thessalonians, the book, One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich. It describes how this man, Ivan, experienced the horror of being held in a Soviet prison camp. While in this prison camp, he, one day he was praying with his eyes closed and another prisoner walks up to him, mocking him and saying, praying in this place is not going to get you out any faster. Ivan looked up at him, fixed his eyes upon him and said, I do not pray to get out but to do the will of God. <laughs> I wonder, could this have been what was on the heart and mind of the Apostle Paul as he begins to close this letter by asking prayer from the believers in Thessalonica? He, his prayer request doesn't seem to be about him, but it seems to be about the will of God. This prayer request doesn't seem to be about his desire, but it seems to be about the desire of God. This prayer request doesn't seem to, to be about him being glorified. It seems to be about God being glorified. So as we look in this passage, let's look at this prayer request. Chapter 3 in 2 Thessalonians, verses, verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may run swiftly and be glorified just as it is with you. And that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. For not all have faith. This is God's holy word. God, we come before you today thanking you for your word and the encouragement that we find in your word. I just thank you for the work that you've done this week in the life of each one that is here. I thank you for God pressing upon each one a desire to be here today. Now, God, let us hear from you. You speak to us. Take this message, God. You fix, form, and fashion it in the hearts of each one of us, God, to help us to always look to you in everything. And God, in all, we give you praise, glory, and honor. And God, if there's one with us today who doesn't know you through your son, Jesus Christ, God, we pray that today they would cry out, what must I do to be saved? Now you move, God. You minister upon hearts. And God, you be glorified in everything. Your son be magnified in everything. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. As we are looking through at this prayer, it, it appears in the second letter of Paul's to the Thessalonian church that he's He's seeking to encourage believers. As we've been through this second letter, that's all it seems to be about is encouragement. As a matter of fact, Paul starts off in chapter 1 being encouraged and sharing how encouraged he is with the believers there. Because in the midst of this fierce persecution that they're experiencing, they are 
growing in their faith and their love for one another is growing. As a matter of fact, Paul goes as far as to say that their love abounded. Oh, he was encouraged by that. But Paul also understood that that they needed to be encouraged because they were facing this fierce persecution. He wanted to encourage them to, to remember that the righteous judge would appear. They didn't have to worry about the trouble they were facing. We have a righteous judge and one day he will appear and his judgment will be exact. When we get to chapter 2, we see Paul is continuing to encourage them by correcting some false teaching. And the false teaching that we found in in chapter 2 to begin with had to do with the day of the Lord. They were telling the believers that they were in the day of the Lord at that time. and, and, And God's judgment was about to come upon them, but... But Paul helps them to understand, no, for believers, when the day of the Lord comes, it's a day we can look to. It's a day that we can be excited about that Jesus is going to come and gather us home together. But he also tells them, he tells them that there's a couple of things that's going to happen because the day of the Lord is not going to be a good day for unbelievers. The day of the Lord is going to be a terrible time for those who don't know Jesus as Lord and Savior. And so Paul tells them there are a couple of things to look for. First, there will be a falling away. As a matter of fact, it's been described as a great falling away. And what he's saying is there's going to be rebellion all over the land. People will rebel against God and God's word. And he tells them not only, not only will there be a falling away, but the man of sin, the son of perdition that he will be exposed or he will be revealed on toward the end of chapter 2 we find that Paul or as we get to the middle of chapter 2 Paul continues talking about the antichrist and he shares a couple things with them about the antichrist one he shares his character how his character is against everything of God and he shows his challenge And the Antichrist will be faced with many challenges. But last week we found out in chapter 2 that Paul continues to encourage the believers by telling them, reminding them that they've been chosen by God. And because they've been chosen by God, that they could cling to God's word. Well, today... As we look in chapter 3, we see that first word, finally. And this word is one of those conjunction words that begins to, it's there to tie in what's being said with what's about to be said. And as it's tying it in here, the word finally is used when, when it's trying to let us know that there's, they're about to come to a close. It suggests the transitioning To close out the letter. So here Paul offers or asks for a request. Not just any request. Now Paul could have asked for money to help the ministry. But he doesn't. Paul could have asked for help. But he doesn't. Paul could have asked that that they would make his name great in the land, but he doesn't. Instead, Paul asks for prayer. He doesn't just ask for prayer, but he asks for specific prayer. (laughs) We can't miss that. Because I wonder, I can't help but wonder how many of us offer up specific prayer requests. What I mean is when we ask someone to pray for us, are we specific about what we want them to pray for? Or do we just say, just remember me? I wonder, I wonder sometimes, are we, do we care enough about prayer that when someone would ask us to pray for them, that we would ask them, what specifically do you want me to pray about? 
You know, the Bible tells us we have not because we ask not. And, you know, what we're good at doing, what I'm good at doing is just saying, God, just bless me or God, help me or God, I'm calling out to you. But do we get specific with our prayer requests? I understand there are times when we, 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 God knows all about it. Yes, God does know all about it. And maybe in a big setting, you don't want to be too specific, but there should be somebody you're talking to. Somebody you're requesting prayer from. And that you want to be specific with them. And listen, when we hear someone, when we know someone's wanting us to pray for them, if, if it's in a story, but they don't want to pray there, they just want you to remember them, ask them, what specifically would you like me to remember? I think there's, there's a lot of things that we need in this life. There are a lot of things we need help with. There's a lot of things we need to call God, call on God about, but we don't do it because we don't ask specifically. <laughs> well, specifically speaking, <laughs> this prayer request that Paul shares is one that should be on the lips and on the hearts of each and every one of us. And there are two parts to this prayer request. And the first part is that we, it should be on our hearts and on our lips to pray for the proclamation of the word of God. What do you mean, preacher? Well, Paul asked prayer that the word of the Lord would run swiftly. The phrase run swiftly, it means to have free course. It means to progress through the world. Also, Paul goes in this prayer request for the word, proclamation of the word to run swiftly. He asks that the, the proclamation of the word of God to be glorified. The, that word glorified, it means that it's true power. It means that the glory would be acknowledged. In other words, the glory of this prayer request, the glory of the word of God would be acknowledged by others. As a matter of fact, Paul goes as far as to say, just as it is with you. Now, Paul seems to be saying, just as the word of the Lord has come to you, and you have received the life-giving, life-transforming truth. Pray that it goes forth into the world and progresses the same as it has with you. <laughs> How can the word of God go forth? It must be proclaimed. It must be proclaimed. Now, I want to ask, is it life-giving? The word of God? Is it life-giving? Say amen. It's okay. Is it life transforming? Say amen. It's okay. If anybody understood this, Paul understood it. If anyone understood that there was power in the word of God. And it, whenever it's proclaimed, Paul understood this. He understood the life-giving power of the proclaimed word of God. He understood the life transforming power of the proclaimed word of God. So the, the Bible teaches us that Paul was a student of the law. Prior to his conversion, he studied the law. As a matter of fact, the Bible says he was zealous for the law. He was so zealous for the law that he excelled above his peers. He sat under one of the best teachers there was of the day. So that tells me Paul would have known about Ezekiel. So if Paul knew about Ezekiel, he knew that there was one day when Ezekiel was sat down in the midst of a valley. And in the midst of this valley were nothing but dry bones. That's all that was in the valley was dry bones. And so Paul would have read about how God told, asked Ezekiel, son of man, can these bones live? And Ezekiel's response was, oh, Lord God, you know. Paul would have known that God told Ezekiel to say, oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. So Ezekiel proclaimed the word of the Lord to dry bones. And the Bible says there was a noise. The Bible says there was a rattling together and the bones came together bone to bone and then Ezekiel saw, saw muscles he saw flesh he saw skin form upon these bones and then God said to Ezekiel 
thus says, I mean, when he saw that, all he saw was just bodies laying there. There was still no life in these bodies. They had been transformed, but there was no life in these bodies. But Paul would have known that Ezekiel didn't walk away. But God spoke to him again and said, now, now, Ezekiel, what you what you need to do is uh, just continue to proclaim the word of the Lord. And Ezekiel says, come forth the four winds, breathe and breathe on these slain and as that they may live. And as as God told Ezekiel to share these words, Ezekiel did just that. He proclaimed the word of the Lord. He says, breath come to them. And they, the Bible says that they stood up to their feet and they were an exceedingly great army. I want to tell you, it's a life changing word. It's a transforming word if we will proclaim the word of God. Yeah. Folks, there's power. Life giving power. Life transforming power in the proclaimed word of God. Just as the proclaimed gospel of Jesus Christ, the proclaimed word of God has transformed the life given to these believers of Thessalonica. Paul was saying, pray, pray, pray that the proclaimed word of God would run swiftly. Amen. That it would have free course. That it would progress through the world. <laughs> Let me ask you, what would it look like today if the word of God ran swiftly? If the word of God had free course? If the word of God progressed through our world? What if it happened through our world just as it has right here? <laughs> I'm not talking about in this building. <laughs> I'm talking about in your lives. I'm not bragging on no preaching. I'm just saying the word of God has come through your life. If you've been born again, if you've been saved, if your name's been recorded in the Lamb's book of life, the word of God has been proclaimed and it ran swiftly through your heart. And you received it. So the question becomes, what if it went through the world just as it's went through you? Do you think it would have an effect? Do you think it would be life-giving and life-transforming? <laughs> well, I believe the world, I, I, maybe I'm just biased. May, maybe, maybe I'm just biased. But I believe the world would have to acknowledge the source of the proclaimed word of God. And I believe Jesus Christ would be glorified throughout the world if it ran swiftly through this world like it ran through you and I. I'm convinced that our educational system would change. I'm convinced that if the word of God would run swiftly through our educational system, we would stop, we would see every boy and every girl behaving in school because every boy and every girl would hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and we'd see more people coming to know Jesus than running away from Jesus. It wouldn't just change the classroom, but it would change homes because those children would go home and praise the Lord to their mom and dad that, that the Jesus had saved me. Those moms and dads would want to find out who is this Jesus and they would come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior. It would change radically our school systems. Oh, but that ain't all it would do. <laughs> I believe if the word of God would just run swiftly, if it would be proclaimed through the world as it has here in some of your lives, that it would change our legal system. What do you mean, preacher? <laughs> I mean that if they would stop preaching the need for reform and start proclaiming the need for criminals to be transformed, I believe our, our uh, judicial system, our, our legal system would be altered so that it wouldn't need all these buildings that they're housing prisoners in. I'm also convinced it would change our election system. <laughs> Because if the word of the Lord run through this world as it does you and I. <laughs> I'm hoping it's running through you and I. It's running through me. But if it ran through the world the whole way, there wouldn't be a divide over Democrats and 
Republicans. This world wouldn't be divided because of who you check on a piece of paper. And not only that, but I believe if it ran through this world like you run through me, like you run through you, I just believe that it would alter in such a way that this world would demand that every politician who's ever elected would know Jesus Christ and live their lives as if they were a born again believer. It would change. So Paul was saying, pray, pray that the word of the Lord. Folks, if we, listen, the, I'm, I'm convinced of this. I'm convinced Hebrews 4 and 12 says, for the word of God is living and powerful. What if this living and powerful word went through this world? Folks, I want to tell you, he says that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Listen, it's got the power to yes. change everything. Amen. Oh, if we want to change our rebellious children, if we want to change our wayward spouses, our selfish co-workers, our unconcerned neighbors, maybe we need to become more specific in our prayer requests. Maybe we should pray that the life-giving, life-transforming power of the proclaimed word of God would run swiftly through our hearts. Because changing someone might mean changing you. You've seen Christians and you've heard people talk about Christians, professing born-again believers. The word you thought in your mind, but if that's being saved, I don't want nothing to do with it. Oh, if the proclaimed word of God gets really in our hearts, the testimony would be, that's what being saved is about. And I want to know the man that they know. It's life transforming. And we need to be praying that it goes out. It runs swiftly. It progresses through this world. Yes, that should be on our lips. It should be on our hearts. But also on our hearts and lips should be prayerful protection for the messenger of God. Paul, again, in verse 2, Paul adds to his prayer request protection for himself and other messengers of God. He asked the believers in Thessalonica to pray that they would be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. The word unreasonable here, it means to be out of place. We see the word unreasonable used again in the book of Acts. And in the book of Acts in 25 and 27, it states that for it seems to me unreasonable to send a prisoner and not specify the charges against him. What that says to me is it just doesn't make sense to send a prisoner to prison, but there's no charges made against him. To send a prisoner before a judge and there's no charges before. It's out of place. It doesn't make sense. So Paul was saying there are men. <laughs> there are some men out there and it just doesn't make sense just how wicked they are. But pray. But pray that we will be delivered from them. <laughs> If we continue to just investigate Paul's life, we could call on so many others in the scriptures. But if we just investigate Paul's life, we find that he understood what it was like to be in the hands of unreasonable men. Wicked men. Just before Paul arrived in Thessalonica, he, he encountered some unreasonable and wicked men. <laughs> When he launched off from Antioch for his second missionary journey, Paul went through Tarsus and then he went through Galatia. And what Paul was doing was he was going to go back to visit the churches he had already established in his first missionary journey. But then Paul had on his mind he's going to Asia Minor. So when he's docked at a port, he hears this Macedonian call. <laughs> In other words, the Holy Spirit hindered him from what he wanted to do. And it set him on a different course. Now, you've got to get this. Paul 
is in the center of God's will. Because he doesn't go where he wants to go. He goes where God is sending him. He boards a ship and about 125 miles later, out in sea, later they dock. And when they dock, Paul's in Europe. And when he's in Europe, <laughs> while they're in Europe, he, he gets out at Philippi. And while they're at Philippi, he notices that there's this young girl and she's possessed with an evil spirit. But what he doesn't understand at that time is she's also possessed by a slave owner. This young girl was a slave and, and she was possessed with an evil spirit and this slave owner used her as that evil spirit was using her to make money. So what does Paul do when he sees this girl in the will of God? He sees this girl who, who is possessed with this evil spirit. He casts that evil spirit out of her. <laughs> well, this young girl is no longer enslaved by this evil spirit. This young girl is now, her life has been changed. She is set free. She's now delivered. And now she's no longer possessed. And, and you would think as she now for the first time has a sense of normalcy, you would think that everyone would be excited. You would think that everyone would be happy and joyous and they would just be praising God. You would think that they would be coming around Paul wanting to know, who's this man Jesus that you're speaking of? <laughs> That's not what happened. When, they, when the slave owner found out what had happened, he saw his money was being hindered. And because his money was hindered, they laid hands on Paul and Silas. And when they laid hands on Paul and Silas, they brought them to, to the authorities, charging them with, with, uh, with interfering with this owner's business. And, and they were publicly beaten. They were imprisoned. They were tortured in the center of God's will. And this was just one occasion that Paul experienced being in the hands of unreasonable and wicked men. So Paul asked, pray for us to be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. Doesn't it just seem strange to you? Doesn't it seem unreasonable to you that men and women would want to attack messengers of the word of God? Seriously, seriously. I mean, our message is one of love and joy and peace and hope. Our message is one of salvation and redemption and, and restoration and eternal life. So why would we need protection as a messenger of the word of God? Why would we need protection because we're sharing God's word? Well, Paul says, for not all have faith. <laughs> Folks, there are missionaries out there that are around people who are not of faith. And they need our prayers for their protection as they share God's word. There are evangelists out there who need our prayers for protection as they share God's word. There are pastors out there I need, other pastors need your prayer for protection as we share the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Listen. I want to ask, I'm gonna get a little specific with us. If I asked you to pray to God for protection, how would you pray? I hadn't thought of it, preacher. Well, let me give some suggestions. That when you pray for my protection, <laughs> pray that God would protect me physically. You know, folks, pastors, and even myself, on the road a lot now. I know what you're thinking. You ain't been nowhere in two years, preacher. I, I know. I know you're thinking that. But you know, COVID is lifting. All those restrictions and restraints are lifting. People aren't getting it and getting as sick, even if they do get it, as they were a couple years ago. So, yeah, pastors will be traveling from now on. Hospitals are letting us in now. And you know what? I'm here. I'm here now. And what I mean by saying that is I'm here most of the week. And often it's by myself. <laughs> Folks, if, if, a, 
if someone was coming in to harm anyone with a weapon, who do you think the target is? Whoever it is that's standing where I'm standing today. So I would ask, pray, pray for me physically. Pray that God would protect me physically. That I'd be able to go and do what he would have me to do unharmed physically. But also pray for me emotionally. Why emotionally? Because so often pastors will focus on the needs and the cares of everyone in the congregation. And they will neglect their own needs and their own cares. They will sacrifice their families. They will sacrifice their their mental state. They will sacrifice their own health. Because we're worried about others and trying to take care of others. And folks, we hear things. We hear things and we see things. I'm not talking about just spiritual things. I'm talking about there's people who are hurting in this world. There are people who are going through struggles in this world. And we go into homes and we sit with people who are crying and we cry with them and we minister to them. And and some of us don't know how to detach ourselves from the emotional part of them. And we get so caught up in it that we're so drained that we don't know what to do emotionally. I want to tell you, if you're going to pray for protection for your pastor, pray that I'm protected physically and emotionally. And not just your pastor, every pastor, but also pray. Also pray. Because, you know, everybody doesn't receive things the way you think they might or they should. And there's a caveat to that. What I mean is be careful that you judge them because... When it comes to you, you may not receive it as well either. And it emotionally just drains pastors. But we need to also pray. And I would ask you to pray for me that I be protected spiritually. We hear all the time of pastors leaving the ministry because of moral failure. And we focus on the act. In other words, we focus on the rumor of what took place. But I'm just convinced there's more to it than what took place. What is the root of it? Yeah, I know the root of the root is sin. And I know we're pulled away into sin by the lust of our eyes and the lust of our flesh and our pride. The devil don't make us do anything. Y'all know that, right? He can't make me do a thing. I got the Holy Spirit living inside of me. And he's stronger than the, than the uh, evil one. And I, I've come to understand this. If I do fall in sin, it's because I chose to. Through my own lust and my own pride. But there's men out there. Who are pouring in to people. The word of God. Every Sunday. And through the week. They're going to their homes when they're hurting and when they're sick. So my question becomes, if they're doing this week in and week out, how in the world can someone who is spending time with God succumb into their own lust and their own pride? Huh. Maybe, just maybe it's because we spend so much time Pouring into a congregation and spend so little time pouring into ourselves. <laughs> what do you mean pouring into yourself, preacher? I know these things are on your mind. Here's what I'm meaning. You know, we should all be about the work of God. The work of God is a good work, the Bible says. And it is a good work. And we should all be about our father's business. But we can't be about the work of God and not worship God. If we fail to worship God, (laughs) the work of God will be in vain. If we fail to worship God, the work of God will have no power. If we fail to worship God, the work of God will have no anointing. And I want to say to us all, let's make sure we're worshiping God. And pray that your pastors are all worshiping God. Yes. (laughs) I'm convinced that we need to have on our hearts and lips a prayer 
that the word of God would run swiftly through our land and that the messengers of God, the proclaimers of the word of God, that they would be protected. So let's pray together for the protection of all messengers of the word of God. As we're coming to a close here. After visiting America in 1831, French writer Alexis, Alexis de Tocourt, de Courtville, Alexis de Tocqueville, that's his name, Alexis de Tocqueville, he says, I sought, he, he was seeking for the greatness of the United States, and he wanted to know what, what was it that made us so great? So he comes to the United States to see what makes us such a great nation. I'm talking about in 1831. When he got here, he said he looked at our spacious harbors. He looked at our ample rivers and our fertile fields and our boundless forest. But he didn't see what made us great. He said that he saw our rich mines. He saw our vast commerce. He saw the public school systems and the institutions of higher learning. And our, the reason for our greatness was not there. He even witnessed Congress and saw our matchless constitution. And he found that our greatness was not there. It was not until he went into a church in America and he heard from the pulpits a flame of righteousness shouted. That's when he said, I found the secret to the success of America. I imagine from that point on, his prayer was that the word of God would run swiftly. I imagine he prayed for the protection of those who shared God's word. So my question today to each and every one of you. Knowing that, the, that there's power in prayer. And prayer has the power to transform a country. It has the power to transform a state. It has the power to transform a community. It has the power to transform a life. Knowing that the prayers of the righteous avails much. I want to ask, can you commit today to pray? Can you commit today that you'll pray for those who proclaim the gospel? That they would be protected. And that you would pray that the gospel message would go through this country swiftly. I would ask that you would do this whenever you bow down to pray. But more than that, there's some of you here today who have some prayer needs. Prayer concerns. And I just believe today that... It, if you would get specific with God, <laughs> I believe he would come on the scene and he'd minister in a powerful way. I'm going to ask Brother Roger, Brother Don, Brother Mike. I'm going to ask Miss Evelyn if she would. I'm going to ask if you would come up here and as you come that before this congregation, if you've got a prayer that you need prayed for, if you would specifically state it to these men and let them pray with you, Miss Katie, would you come up and be willing to pray for them? Is there one that would come while this, they sing the song of invitation? Listen, this is a time when you can, 
You can be specific. These men ain't going to go around telling nobody about your prayer requests. These women are not going to tell, run around and share what's going on. But you can get specific and they'll pray with you. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. If you'll get specific with him and tell him that you need a Savior. He'll send Jesus immediately into your heart. Oh, I'd love to talk to you about Jesus. You who don't know Jesus as Savior, I'm going to come down, but I want to talk to you about him. But you've got to know if there's something specific that you need from him.